Hello, Living Church. It is great to be back with you. It's been a bitter, cold winter, and I've had my own perfect storm. <laughs> Thank you. But I think I'm on the uphill incline and uh, getting stronger every day. Very thankful to be back with you and to share God's word with you. We are starting a new series called True. Sounds presumptuous, but it's true. <laughs> So we're going to dive into it through the letter of 1 John, and we're encouraging you to follow along with us in a reading plan. The reading plan is there on the Berean website, or if you prefer, there's a little bookmark you can pick up each week at the, uh, help, the uh, guest center, and it will just give you some readings to do, not only in the, the letter of 1 John, but also in the Gospel of John, so that you can have a, a wider sense of, of what is being said here. So we encourage you to to read your Bible, and specifically to follow along in this reading plan with us. And when we start reading the letter of 1 John, we're off and running. I mean, there's no greeting. We don't know who is exactly it's addressed to. Uh, there, there's nothing fancy about it. We're just off to the races in this urgent but gentle deep dive, not only into theology, but into my own life. John is looking at us and saying, I want you to learn some things, and, and scholars have said it's impossible to outline the letter of 1 John in some kind of easy outline. It, it's more like a tornado. It just keeps spiraling up, and the same things keep coming back around each time. So the Holy Spirit must have thought it right that John should repeat these important things. Today we're going to read just 12 verses, and as we read those verses... There are three absolutely essential pillars of theology that you need to understand. For example, we're going to talk about the identity and nature of Jesus Christ in something called the hypostatic unity of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that. Secondly, we're going to talk about the, the extent and the nature of sin. And thirdly, we're going to talk about the extent of the atonement in a big word called propitiation. Now, don't let all the vocabulary scare you away because John puts it in simple street language. And so if we master this language, we're going to have some great footholds to take us through the rest of the letter. And it's all woven into this personally piercing, invasive self-examination so that we can be lights in our world. And the question that's going to be asked of us over and over and over again is, do I believe and do I live the truth? So if you're able to stand this morning, would you stand with me as we read God's word, the first 12 verses of the letter of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves." and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God. You may be seated. 
there's a video series out there on the web, web that, that is called The Americans, and it's a, a spy drama that is set in the Reagan eras of, era of the early 1980s. And it's about Philip and Elizabeth Jennings, who are, who are two normal-looking Americans, and they have two normal-looking teenagers, and they have a travel agency in Falls Church, Virginia. But everything about their life is fake because they are two highly trained KGB agents from Russia. And they were highly trained to not have any accent to know all about America. And they live in this country. And everything they do has a hidden agenda. And every relationship they have is phony. It's somehow laced with spying on people. And even their marriage is a sham. Everything about them is just shallow. It's surface because they serve another loyalty. Now, John is going to attack this kind of thing, not only in other people, but also in me and in you. Am I for real? Are my motives clear? Do I walk in the light? And John wants us to be able to identify what is true versus what is fake. He wants us to know what's authentic versus what is counterfeit. And not only because of outsiders who creep into the living church, but also within myself and my own self-examination. So let's talk about some things that are true that John wants us to know about. And it begins with what I call true solidarity. I was going to use the word unity, but that's not quite strong enough. If we're in unity, sometimes it means we just agree with someone and, and we'll go along with it. But solidarity means kind of linking arms with fellow marchers and marching across the bridge or marching in demonstration that I am totally committed. I'm all in, in solidarity with others who believe the same thing that I believe. John here is talking about solidarity in the form of fellowship. He says in verse 3, so that you may have fellowship with us as we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. He's talking about there needs to be a true belief about Jesus Christ. There needs to be a core solidarity about who he is so that the living church can have true fellowship with each other. In fellowship here, we're not talking about red punch in the fellowship hall. We're talking about true koinonia, feeling absolutely one with others who believe the same thing. And John is going to say what I'm talking about is solidarity of the apostolic testimony. You see, there's a true testimony that's been passed down through us. And John is saying, I want you to have fellowship with us, the us meaning the apostles, because we're the ones who have seen and heard and looked upon and touched who Jesus really is. And these apostles are proclaiming the truth about Jesus. Listen to how John starts his letter. He says, that which was from the beginning. What does that bring to your mind? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. Postulate any beginning that you want to start. Any place you want to start, go back as far as your mind can take you. Postulate any beginning. Whatever that beginning already was, he was already there in the beginning. He also says, talks about the word of life at the end of verse 1, this word of life. What does that bring to mind? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The sum total of all wisdom and knowledge and power and authority resides in this word. So John, in his first preamble here, is talking about some huge things. He's saying, I'm talking to you about the eternality of Jesus Christ. I'm talking to you about the self-existence and the eternal existence of the living Son of God. And not only that, in his simple way, he's, he's grounding us in theology. He said, this eternal Son of God also 
ate hamburgers and fries. And we walked with him. We tossed the Frisbee. We played tackle football. We, we witnessed the blind seeing. We witnessed him rising, raising people from the dead. And we witnessed his own resurrection from the dead. John is saying, I was there. I was the one who leaned against him at the Last Supper. I have been around him. I've smelled him. I've touched him. I've seen him. I've handled him. I watched his beard grow. And his feet got dirty. And I watched him spend three minutes at a green arrow waiting for a left turn. <laughs> Stuck in sequence in America. I watched his lips get chapped and I watched him bleed. This eternal son of God, I have handled true solidarity as a believing, living church believes this and preserves this. But fakers and imposters and deep thinkers came along thinking, well, we've thought this through and we know better. And they were Gnostics. It was Gnosticism. Does that help you? Probably not. How about Greek dualism? Maybe that doesn't help a whole lot either. But the Gnostics were Greek dualists, meaning that the whole universe was split in half. There was the material, which is evil, and there is the, the spirit, which is good. And these two things can never touch. In fact, being a great art critic myself, if you look at the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo has God coming down, and Adam and God don't quite touch because his painting was influenced by Greek Philosophy. Well, the Gnostics believed that by definition, it's impossible for God to become man because God can't actually contact this evil world. It's inconceivable from the start. And so those of us who are stuck in a material world can find meaning and hope and salvation through knowledge. That's the heart of that word, gnosis, is knowledge. We can find hope and redemption through levels of knowledge, secret handshakes and esoteric revelations that we perceive. And the highest form of that knowledge is to recognize the divine element, guess where? Inside of you. So your original Oprah is divine. It has power. It has authority. If you can discover your inner Deepak, then you can become powerful and true and pure, and you will feel the presence of God. And this kind of Gnosticism has never faded away. In fact, it's only expanded. Let me read from their own documents what the Mormons believe about Jesus. The difference between Jesus and other offspring of Elohim is one of degree, not of kind. Human beings generally were similarly existent in the spirit state prior to their embodiment in the flesh. There's no impropriety, therefore, in speaking of Jesus Christ as the elder brother of the rest of mankind. Now, what they believe, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes that Jesus is the offspring of the father and one of his heavenly wives. And that he was the mightiest created spirit child of God, as are we. But that Jesus was not unique. He was simply the first. Well, there's a trickle down here from ancient Gnosticism in the first century to the 1800s when that was written in Mormon theology. Well, what does Islam believe about Jesus? They say, Allah, most gracious, has begotten a son. Indeed, you have put forth a thing most monstrous. Add it, the skies are ready to burst, the earth to split asunder, and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. That they should invoke a son for Allah, most gracious? For it is not consonant with the majesty of Allah, most gracious, that he should beget a son. That was written probably around 600 A.D. 
Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the son of God. He was a very important prophet. He didn't die on the cross. He was either mistaken and Simon of Cyrene was actually crucified or he was crucified and swooned and appeared to die and taken down off the cross before he died and that the resurrection is a myth. Well, these are all the children, some of the children, and the grandchildren, the great, 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 great grandchildren of the Gnostics, which is basically humanism, saying, you know, either God can't touch us or we really don't need God. What we need is more knowledge about things, and we will ascend to our true godlike nature. And John recognizes it, and he's giving us this test of authenticity. The living church, to have true fellowship, must have a consonant and must have a consistent theology of who Jesus is. So in 451 AD, in a city near Istanbul named Chalcedon, they came and came up with the definition called the hypostatic unity of Jesus Christ. Now, if you know what acetaminophen is, and if you know what a microdiscectomy is, or if you can describe a triple toe loop in the Olympics, you can, you can handle this word hypostatic. You might not use it in common conversation. All it means is it comes from a, a Greek word, hypostasis, which means personal. The personal unity of Jesus. And what I'm about to read to you is not just word salad. This is the definition they came up with, trying to build a boundary around when you start running off the rails about who Jesus is. Listen to these words. Jesus is in two natures without mixture, change, division, or separation. The difference of natures not being removed by their union, but rather the propriety of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person. So that he is not divided or separated into two persons, but the only Son, God, the Word, our Lord Jesus Christ, and one and the same person. Now, you may not get all of that, but get verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John brings it down and said, that guy <laughs> that I touched and saw and walked with and who bled on the cross, he is the very God, a very God in human form. We as the living church need to nail this down. This is still under attack by every other cult and religion and by progressives who come within the church saying, you know what, it really needs to be Jesus plus something else. And you need to have solidarity with Jesus Christ and with the living church by having a radar to test what you are hearing, to basically ask one question, how do they describe who Jesus is? That needs to be core theology. He is the eternal life, the same person who ate and slept and drank and bled. And that's what John is going to say over and over in his letter. And he says it in these first four verses. Then he brings us to another Truth, and that is true reality. If there's anything I've learned in life, and especially in leadership, is that if you don't clearly define the problem, you'll never find a solution. If you don't describe and diagnose what's really wrong, you can never fashion the solution or the healing for it. Up until recently, uh, I was driving an older BMW SUV, and I loved that car because it had a heated steering wheel. I mean, if there's ever anything that was, should be obvious <laughs> is a heated steering wheel. And, and I, but this car had a bunch of, bunch of ghosts and gremlins in it. 
And I kept fixing it because I liked the heated steering wheel. And so I replaced gaskets, and it had, a, it had a misfire in it somewhere. And I had it diagnosed three different times, even by BMW, and everybody went, well, we, we don't know what this is for sure. It could be this, it could be that. So like any shade tree mechanic, I threw parts at it. You know, I got a fuel pump and a fuel filter. I checked out the transmission. I, I put in a new ventila- uh, crankcase ventilation system and, and uh, checked the spark plugs and did all I could, and nothing ever changed. So finally, I got sick of it, and I sold it. Actually, I sold it three times. <laughs> In full disclosure, <laughs> the f- first two guys who bought it brought it back within a week and said, uh, no, I'm not interested anymore. Give me my money back, which I told them I would do. But finally, a third sucker, I mean, a third, <laughs> a third creative mechanic came along and said, I want this car, and I was glad to see it drive down the block and out of my life. I could never find out what the problem was. So I couldn't apply anything to fix it. And the story of human nature and the story of human life is that we often misdefine what the true problem is. And John is about to identify and describe the deepest problem of humanity. The deepest problem in politics, the deepest problem in your family of origin, the deepest problem in your spouse, and the deepest problem in me. And we must grasp this absolute truth about reality. A newspaper in the early 1900s ran an an editorial saying, we would like you to write your response to this. What is humanity's greatest problem? G.K. Chesterton wrote back a two-word answer. He said, I am. And that gets at what John is talking about. He says in verse 5, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is absolute purity. He's absolute holiness. There's no grading on the curve in God's character. God is absolute light, but I want to dodge into the shadows. I don't like to live under the white, hot conviction of his holiness and his voice. And John is saying, let's make one thing perfectly clear before we start diagnosing, that God is light. And there can be, there is no, there never will be any darkness in him. But he talks about the delusion of darkness. It says, if we say we have fellowship in while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And of course, he's accusing the Gnostics and the infiltrators of saying that if Jesus is just a bauble on your charm bracelet or if he's just an app on your phone, but he hasn't changed your life, John may not be judging their salvation, but he's certainly saying, you don't have fellowship with us if you continue to walk in darkness. And you don't have fellowship with the Father because he is pure light. Fellowship is broken when we step into that darkness. And the Gnostics believed that since the material world is fallen and broken, I might as well just indulge myself here because matter doesn't matter. What really matters is what I believe. And John is going to say, no, the way you live, this is going to recur over and over and over again in the letter of 1 John. It's the way you live shows whether you truly desire fellowship with God or whether you want to just go your own way. Now, for the believer, for the living church, I want you to make note of this, and we'll talk about it at other points. He's talking about fellowship here, not salvation. But he's saying if you're a believer, for example, and and your lifestyle is such that you're living in the shadows, you're drawn to the darkness, it's going to be very hard for you to feel really true fellowship in a small group or in a larger congregation because you know you're outside of what the Lord wants for your life. So don't lie to yourself. God can't be redefined or diminished or reconstituted On our sliding scale of character, he is light. 
He also then says, he warns us, he says, beware of deflection. He says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are some who would say, well, I have no sin. I mean, sin is not a problem. There's no sin nature. After all, humanity is basically good. It's only you uptight Puritans and Baptists who care about these kinds of things. It's only you morality cops that make it miserable for the rest of us. And, and my neuroses, my psychoses, my, my obsessions, and what appears to you to be my selfishness is really a result of your disapproval and shaming. It's your problem that I have all these problems. <laughs> Because what I'm doing is not a sin. It's my identity. And it's what I deserve. It's my right. And the, the Gnostics were claiming they didn't have a sin nature. But can you hear that in our culture all over? I'm not, I don't have a problem. It, it's you neurotic people who want to live by law or rules or morality. You're the ones who are making me crazy. Because my identity is pristine. And then he says, beware of denial of sin, verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So on the one hand, people deny there's a sin nature. In this case, they deny that I personally have done any sin at all. The dog ate my homework. That was somebody else. You mistook me for someone else. It wasn't me. That, that we deny that our actions, our intentions, our motives, our words have been sinful. And here John says, if you do that, you are accusing God of misleading you. You're saying, God, you're a liar because you said sin was my greatest problem and you sent the wrong solution for that problem, who is Jesus Christ. You're making him out to be a, a liar. You're denying the very word of truth. Well, here are two huge essentials that we need to have in our spiritual backpack. On the one hand, we need to know absolutely it is so important and essential that we know who Jesus was and is. He is the Word made flesh. No matter what your sophistication of theology, no matter how deeply you want to go into that, and you can delve really deeply into that, you need to know this, believer. It's what they do with Jesus that makes all the difference and what we do with Jesus. And secondly, the pervasiveness of sin in every person. Don't say it doesn't matter. Don't define human problems by some other means because sin is the greatest human problem. And this is a very current issue. And you need to be expert on this. You need to have a radar flashing. You need to have a dashboard light going off. For example, when you hear critical theory, whatever version of critical theory you want to call it, whether it's racial or economic or gender or whatever, they define the core problem of humanity as power. Hegemonic racism, hegemonic economics, hegemonic gender Hegemonic religion. And the problem is power and how it's abused. Now, any thinking Christian must agree that when sinners congregate, things get even worse. And there are systems that do need to be dismantled. There are things that are oppressive. We, there's no doubt about that. But here's the problem. They define the problem as being that class, that gender, that religion, that sex, that race, it's, they are the ones who are the problem. And what we need to do is switch that class or that race with another one that is somehow pristine and pure. And that will only lead to chaos. Why? Because we've defined the problem wrongly. Because, you know, every time you elect somebody, you elect a sinner. And what this world needs is redeemed people with a new heart. And hopefully they could get together in something called uh, the living church. 
and set a new dynamic for the world that has the fruit of the Spirit as its essence and its fragrance. But it will never be solved by switching the power dynamics. And something should be clanging in your mind. Maybe not about politics or, or how they all define this or the, the intricacies of all these theories, but you ought to have an alarm going. They have not defined the problem properly. Therefore, there can be no solution. John is talking about the core problem. And it's all about theology. It's about a worldview. And sin is the bane, the blight, the blindness of humanity and it can't be combated by delusions and deflections and denials or blaming some other class or race or economic status. So, let's come to truth number three. Because now John gets very personal and he wants to talk about a true relationship, starting in verse nine. Because if God is light and I am not... How do I live? That sounds Gnostic to me. God is light and I am not. How do I live? Well, here's an invitation to a deep, personal, dependent relationship between someone who has nothing to offer God and a God who has everything to offer to me. So let me share one verse with you. I won't be quite done when I'm done with this one verse, but... This is a verse you should memorize. If we confess our sins, if I bring my dodgy, shadowy, shameful, guilty self and I bring it before God and say, here it is, Lord. I, I know it sounded good, but my motive was wrong. I agree with you, Lord. I confess I said some things in anger that I shouldn't have said. I, I shaved that deal, and I really was untruthful. I, I have a bitterness in my heart toward someone I'm supposed to love. The Scripture says, how do we bridge this gap between God is light and I'm in the shadow? We bring it and we hold it before him, and we just agree with him. This is a smelly pile of me, and I agree with you, Lord. And what does he do? He is faithful. Faithful to what? Faithful to his running after you. Faithful to his mercy and his grace. Faithful to his nature as a loving father. And he's not just nice and maybe can forget it. He is just and will forgive our sins. What does it mean that he was just? It means that there was definitely a record that I had and Jesus paid for it on the cross. For all my sin, past, present, and all into the future, he paid the price for that to satisfy God's justice and release his love to come to a sinner like me. And then it says, he's faithful and just to forgive. Commentators say that this word forgive is too weak in English. What it really means is to send away as far as the east is from the west, to send it far away, and then to bathe us, to scrub us clean, to dry us off and put on new clothing and put on the cloak and put the mantle on our shoulders and kill the fatted calf and say, you're not just going to come back as a servant, you're coming back as a son or a daughter. This is the message of the gospel. This is about the true relationship, knowing who Jesus is and what he did, knowing how smelly I can be in my sin and dodginess. This is the restoration of the relationship. And it doesn't just happen once. It happens daily, hourly, 
momentarily. Lord, I lost it in that green arrow line. Ugh. You know what? I confess it. Here I am again. I used to have a deacon. Started every prayer that way. Here we are again, Lord. And I think that's good theology. This is how a relationship is formed with God. I was growing up in the foothills of Colorado and the soil there is clay. And in the springtime when the snow was melting, we would play in these clay pits and we'd start running through these clay pits and the, st- the, the clay would stick to our shoes until we were like six inches taller. <laughs> and pretty soon we're like running in slow motion because we, had, we were carrying all this baggage. In the life of the believer, the Spirit of God says, why don't you stop and clean off your shoes? Why don't you lighten the load of trying to solve this on your own and just come and confess? Be cleansed, restored, and renewed. This is what is true, and it is repetitive, and it's restorative about our relationship with God. John says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He's just saying how habitual it should be to confess our sin. He's not trying to encourage it as if we shouldn't try to live a more godly life. But then he immediately says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. John is saying, I know you're going to sin. I'm I'm not daft. I'm not imagining that I have given you counsel so that you will live sinless the rest of your life. No, every day you need to make this confession. But when you do, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. And when we sin, aren't we like the prodigal? We tend to self-advocate. He had his speech already, remember? He came back to the father and said, I know, father, I've wronged you, etc. I just want to be a servant in your household. And the father said, nothing doing. I'm bringing you back as a son. I'm bringing you back as a daughter. And here it says, we have an advocate. The word is parakletos, paraclete, the one who comes alongside. He stands up for us in our defense and he says, you be quiet, I'm going to argue this case for you. You need to know that when you feel defeated by your own sin, when you're coming out of the shadows, you need to know that Jesus Christ is standing ready to take your case Because he's just. He goes before the Father and says, this one is mine. I paid for her. I paid for him on the cross. We'll come to it in a few weeks, but as a very comforting verse in chapter 3, verse 20, it says, for whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. I'm not adequate to stand against the prosecuting attorney. Who is that dragon, that devil, that constant accuser who's always accusing me before the Father until the righteous one stands up and says, be silent. My argument is this. The cross paid for this sin and I'm restoring this sinner because he's my son and she's my daughter. He pleads our case because he knows that the price has been paid. And here's a big word we don't have time to unpack, but it's called propitiation. Put that in your Scrabble vocabulary. Here's what it means. I love this definition. It's the appeasement of the wrath of God, his justifiable wrath against sin, by the love of God through the gift of the Son of God. He paid the price. God's justice was satisfied. His love was released. Salvation was made possible. 
Now, these three pillars are fundamental truths. They can be studied and studied and studied till you get a doctorate in any single one of them. But you, as the living church, need to know these as basic DNA that the test of true fellowship ongoing in the living church from the first century until now is what do you do with Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Secondly, what do you define as the deepest human problem? Say it. Don't deny it. Don't dodge it. Don't be deluded about it because we all wrestle with it. But thirdly, what has God done to restore that fellowship for you and for me, to bring a relationship with the Father? It's through confession and cleansing and starting again in fresh grace with him every day. You see, ideas have consequences. And John saw in advance by the Holy Spirit that unless we believe truthfully about these things, we will end up in something other than the kind of fellowship that God wants for his living church. This is all around us, friends. It might have felt like a little bit of a theology class today, but these things are pressing in on the living church. And in these last days, we need to understand, believe, and live these so that our true fellowship with each other and with Jesus himself is made sweeter and sweeter. And may that be the case for us. Let's pray together. Lord, this is, uh, this is a lot, but I pray that by your spirit you would make it simple, that we would remember how to test and approve that which is true and good. And Lord, I pray for us as the living church that by what we believe and how we live it out, that our fellowship would become so infectious, so inviting, so needed for all of us, that we love the fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for what we've experienced this morning. Thank you for your love and grace to us to give us our Bible in our own language that we can understand. And thank you for the Spirit of God who drills it down into practical life for each of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you will join us in our, our little reading program that we have to help you understand the Word in unsupervised reading of the Bible and meditating on it. I know you'll have many questions. I didn't answer all the questions today. But read the Scripture and meditate on it. We want to thank you for worshiping with us today. And maybe you came and there's a burden on your heart. You'd love to have someone pray for you today. And just take your name to heaven's throne and uh, pray for you. We'll have a prayer team down here in the front. They'll meet with you. You can register that on our website too if you go there. Or there's a space across the commons where you can find a quiet spot to pray with servants who will pray with you there. Thank you for worshiping with us and God bless you.